Hello everyone and welcome back to Just Finish Coding. My name is Sriram and this is the first part of the Car Chase series. The goal is to create a game where the player avoids the traffic as long as he can while staying within two boundaries. In addition to the game core, we will also be adding in some additional features such as different levels, a how to play screen, sound effects, collision physics and a lot more. Now before I go on, I must give credit where it is due. While I modified big chunks of the code and fixed a lot of bugs, the original project and art were conceived by Dexterific17. This project contains a lot of images and artwork, so rather than importing each image one by one, it will be a lot faster if you use a starter file. If you click on the downloadable files link in the description below, you will be taken to a Google Drive attachment. Once you're there, you can download the file labeled start. You can load that scratch file into the scratch online editor. And once you've done this, you will be ready to proceed. We can start with the thumbnail sprite. The thumbnail should hide itself when the green flag is pressed and show itself when the stop button is pressed. This may seem like an impossible task because there is no when stop button is pressed event. However, we can improvise and use another feature. Each sprite in Scratch can be assigned a number of graphic effects. These include color, transparency, fisheye, pixelated, etc. These effects all have default values when nothing is specified. In this case, we are concerned only with the transparency. When the stop button is pressed, the transparency effect, which in Scratch is called the ghost effect, will reset to its default value, which is zero. A value of 100 will mean that the sprite is fully transparent and invisible. A value of zero will mean that the sprite is completely opaque and visible. Of course, we can set values between these two numbers. The closer we move to 100, the more transparent a sprite gets, and the closer we move to zero, the more opaque a sprite gets. Given that we know the sprite will become opaque when the stop button is pressed, we just make it transparent when the green flag is pressed. Thus, the sprite seemingly hides when the green flag is pressed and seemingly shows when the stop button is pressed. Let's give those instructions to the sprite in code. When the green flag is clicked, we want the sprite to go to the center of the stage and then show itself. Now this show is pretty misleading. The sprite is shown, but since it will become fully transparent, the user won't be able to see it. Within a forever loop, we always move to the front layer and set ghost effect to 100. That's actually it. If you test out the program now, the thumbnail should hide when the green flag is pressed and show when the stop sign is pressed. Next, we move on to the play button sprite. It is necessary to get a picture of how the play button will work in the intro screen once the green flag is clicked to understand the coding we're about to do. In addition to just being a button to start the game, the player button will carry out a few animations. When the user hovers his mouse pointer over the sprite, the sprite will move slightly to the right and brighten up. This will enable the user to know that he has selected the sprite. At the start, we have to create a variable called game setting for all sprites. We have to keep in mind that the intro screen is not the only stage of the game. If the actual game is going on, then we would obviously want all of these buttons to hide. Game settings simply keeps track of whether the user is in the game lobby, which is what I'll be calling the intro screen from now on, or whether he's playing the game. Since we can't directly view which variables are set for all sprites and which variables are set for this sprite only, I'd recommend you stick to my naming scheme for the variables. I will name the variables which are set for all sprites in capital letters and the variables for this sprite only in lowercase letters. When the green flag is clicked, the user should be led into the lobby, so that's what we set game setting to. Within a forever loop, this sprite will constantly be checking if the game setting is lobby. If it is, then we show the sprite, but if the game setting variable has been changed to playing, then we hide the sprite. This is pretty simple and now we have to specify the location where the button should show itself when the user is in the lobby. We can set the Y position to 90 and enter into an if else condition where the condition is if the mouse pointer is being touched. 
If this is the case, then we know that the user is hovering his mouse over the button. It is time for the fairly simple animation that I mentioned earlier. To achieve this, we change x by negative 170 minus x position to whole divided by 5. Now this line of code may be pretty confusing, so I will explain what it does and why it works. The purpose of this line is to move from whatever x position we are at to an x position of negative 170. When I use the word move, I don't mean the sudden position change we get when we use a go to x, y. Rather, I mean a smooth animation. When the x position is negative 170, then the result of this line of code will be changing x by 0, which means no change at all. But if the x position is currently negative 190, then we will move rightwards to negative 170 within 5 ticks. You can think of this as changing the x position of 25 times rather than changing the x position by 100 a single time. Of course, what happens here is a little bit more complicated than that. Once we change the x position a single time, then the new x position will be used instead of the old one. To use a more accurate example, we cover one-fifth of the remaining distance between two positions every time. This means that the x movement will initially be faster, while the x movement later will be slower. The x position will never actually reach negative 170, but get closer and closer to it. Now Scratch rounds off values once it goes beyond a number of decimals, so we don't have to worry about any shaking. Alright, so next we add a brightness change to 5. This will show the user that he is able to click the button. Within the else statement, we can do the exact same thing, except that we change the x value to negative 190. Now we also only want the additional brightness effect when the mouse is over the button. So here, we just clear graphic effects. This line of code just resets all of the FX to zero. When the sprite is clicked, we want the actual game to start. So we first set the brightness effect of the sprite to 100 to show the player that the button has been pressed, and then we set the game setting variable to playing. If you test out the program now, the button should animate to the right when hovered. When we click the button, it should brighten up and then disappear. Alright, that's it for the play button. You can now take your when green flag is clicked script and throw it into the audio button sprite. We will be reusing almost all of the code, so there is no need to type out the code once again. Since we've already set the game setting in the play button, there is no need to do it again. We can delete that line of code and replace it with the switch costume to on. If you look at the costumes tab, you will see that there are two costumes for the audio button, on and off. When the user arrives at the lobby, the background music will be switched on. If he wants to mute the sounds and play without music, then he can click this button in the lobby. Next, we set Y to negative 90 instead of 90. Of course, the two buttons should not be overlapping, and this button should be below the play button, control button, and difficulty button. When the sprite is clicked, we want to set the costume to whatever it is not at that particular moment. If the costume is off, then we set it to on, and if the costume is on, then we set it to off. Rather than have an if else, we just put in a next costume. This will serve the exact same function. Just like we did for the play button, we set the brightness effect to 100. This code will work, but the player will not be able to mute the music during the game, as he can only click the sprite when he is in the lobby. We can add a mute key. If the player presses the M key, we will mute all sounds. The background music will be set up in the stage, and the volume will be set to 0 or 100 depending on the costume. So until we get to the stage, just switching this costume will be equivalent to muting all sounds. We have a when green flag is clicked, along with a forever loop. If the M key is pressed, then we switch to the next costume. We have to be a bit careful here, as the key presses are extremely sensitive. The user may think that he only pressed the key once, but he may have actually pressed it 4 or 5 times. To make it simpler for him, we wait until the key is no longer pressed before looping again. This way, a key press is counted only if the user presses a key, then removes his fingers from it. 
If you test the audio button, it should function exactly as intended. We can drag and drop the green flag code as well as the sprite press code into the difficulty sprite. We just make a few changes. The costume is initially set to easy rather than on. If you look at the costumes tab of this sprite, you will see that there are four costumes. Easy, Medium, Hard and Extreme. The user can click on the button repeatedly to switch costumes. We set Y to 30 and then make a new variable. We can call it difficulty and set it for all sprites. At the start of the forever loop, we set difficulty to whatever the costume name is. We will use this variable mainly in the obstacle sprite to set the speed of the traffic cars. If you test out the program, you will be able to click on the difficulty button repeatedly to see it change its costume. That's pretty cool and the user has an interactive way to switch the level. We can head back to the play button and drag and drop the when green flag is clicked script. We can also throw in the when sprite is clicked script as most of the code is very similar. We can remove the game setting from both scripts. Of course, we have to change the Y position and we can set it to negative 30. Now when the sprite is clicked, we want the how to play screen to animate and show itself. That is a sprite of its own and it has to know when to begin. To send it a signal, we broadcast a new message called controls. Alright, that's it we'll be doing for this video. If you test out the program now, the lobby screen should be more or less complete. We will deal with the instructions menu and the obstacles later on. If you've enjoyed this video, please make sure you leave a like and also don't forget to subscribe and turn on the notification bell. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.